Working Cows Podcast, Episode 3. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm-challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. This episode of the Working Cows Podcast is brought to you by Kamak Ranch Supply. Check out their website at kamakranchsupply.com. They understand the needs of ranchers and farmers, whether you need to take care of your livestock, horses, or even building supplies. They have everything you need to work your cows, whether that be the chute you work them through, the water you bring them to, or the tools you use to make them go up that chute a little bit faster. So check out their website at kamakranchsupply.com. This episode is also brought to you by chriswilliamsaudio.com. If you're a musician, podcaster, or filmmaker, making your product sound great is crucial. Don't settle for audio that's less than professional. No matter what type of audio service you need, Chris Williams and his team have got you covered. Head on over to chriswilliamsaudio.com for all your audio production needs. Our guest today on the Working Cows podcast is Melinda Sims. Melinda Sims is a member of the Sims Cattle Company located in McFadden, Wyoming. As you will hear, they are ranching at a very high altitude, dealing with a short growing season and long winters. And we're talking today about some of the ways that they uh, go about mitigating the risk of the climate that they live in. So I hope that you enjoy our discussion today with Melinda Sims. Melinda, thank you for joining me today. It's good to have you on, and uh, I'd just like to hear a little bit about uh, the operation that you're a part of and um, kind of the history and your history and, and all those things. So uh, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself just a little bit. All right. Well, thanks for having me. My name is Melinda Sims, and I live on the ranch. It's called Sims Cattle Company in southeast Wyoming. Um, I grew up in Pinedale, Wyoming. I was a round ag, but I didn't live on a ranch. And I moved down here in 2000 and married my husband, Shannon. He is fourth generation on this ranch. Our kids are fifth generation. Um, The ranch has been going since 1942 is when it was established. Um, I can kind of give you a little bit of our resource base. Uh, We are at 7,200 feet. Our average rainfall is around 16 inches, and our growing season is 45 to 50 days if we're lucky. Hmm. Um, We we run on three leased ranches, um, and they uh, together equal 18,400 acres of rangeland and about 7,500 acres of irrigated land. Um, We run 600 head of cows, 300 head of yearling heifers, 40 bulls. 12 horses, two milk cows, and four dogs. Only one of them works. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the yearling heifers, are they being developed into the cow herd? Is that the, the goal? Yes, they are. They're, uh, we keep every heifer that is born here, and every heifer is given a chance to breed, and whatever breeds makes it into our cow herd. Okay. Gotcha. And so the well, Goal of today is to uh, talk a little bit about uh, winter swath grazing and uh, how you guys have been using that. So I guess maybe we should define the term first. What is winter swath grazing? Okay, for us, uh, winter swath grazing um, begins in the summer with our haying season. And what we do is we go ahead and mow our hay and rake it into windrows. And we, we, just generally call it windrow grazing. That's just our term. Um, And then those windrows are left on the ground uh, until we're ready for the cows to be on them and and eat them in the winter time. Okay. Yeah. I I get a little bit confused with the uh, terminology. There was a a series of videos produced by the Alberta uh, government and and they had 
they called it swath grazing and you guys are windrow grazing. So I'll try to keep that straight. <laughs> no problem. I think it might be a regional thing. It might be a ranch thing. I don't know. For sure. Yep. No, I totally get it. We had a windrow or we didn't have a swather when I was growing up. So I understand. <laughs> there you go. Well, we don't have either. We no. have a cutter bar and a rake. Right, right. Well, you got to control those input costs, right? That's right. <laughs> and that depreciation. So, um, yeah. So, uh, what were some of the motivations that led you guys to to start this? So, about 25 or 30 years ago, we leased the second of the three ranches that we have now. Uh, and it had a lot of hay meadow. And we were putting up a lot of hay as it was on our own place to begin with. And so the consensus was that we really didn't want to stack a lot more hay. Um, we had seen that they were doing um, windrow or swath grazing on the Deseret ranches and thought that it might be a good fit for that country, especially considering that it is really rough hay meadows. They had uh, stacked it one year and decided never again would they take the stacking equipment down there. Just going across it with a mower and a rake was plenty um, abuse on our equipment. So kind of those three, three things led us to um, experiment with the windrow grazing and we haven't looked back since. Sure. And how did you start? Was there, was it a kind of a limited rollout of, of the, the windrow grazing? No, they pretty much just windrowed that entire lease. I actually don't know. I think it was about 300 tons. That's about what we get off that place right now is about 300 tons on our windrows. And I think they just kind of jumped in and, and, and did it. You know, we started with just grazing kind of a little bit into the season. We were a little afraid, okay, can our cows handle it? Are they actually going to survive without us starting the tractor every day? Um, and once we realized they actually do better, um, they're not chasing a tractor around, then we really rolled right into it and just kept going with it. Sure. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like you said, you're not running over the rough uh, hay meadow ground with uh, with the tractor. That kind of helps with the, the depreciation piece, I imagine, and some other, some other benefits. So w what have you guys noticed as some of the benefits of your operation moving towards the uh, the windrow grazing? There's a lot of benefits. Um, first of all, like you talked about, is cost. Um, the, the depreciation on your equipment, if you only have to run two pieces of equipment and a two-person hay crew over that ground, that saves so much money. We're able to put up that hay for $50 a ton, and that does, we don't fertilize either. Um, but that $50 a ton includes the labor of feeding it. We don't ever start up a tractor for months on end to go feed our cows. We literally um, spend about an hour every three days for each bunch of cows, which we run two different bunches um, during the winter time. We spend an hour every three days to feed 300 head of cows. <laughs> So labor-wise, it's, it's really effective. Um, Cost-wise, it's really effective. Plus, it has great benefits for the land, too. Um, we've noticed that our manure spread is way better than if you're actually feeding, say, out of a stackyard. Because if you're feeding out of a stackyard, you're not going to get win or try to get your feed to every corner of the meadow. You're going to go where it's most convenient or most protected, and you don't want to waste fuel. Um, but with the windrows, the hay is there where it grows. And so the cows are then defecating and urinating where it grows. Um, we've noticed a big increase in our diversity in the plants. And I think a lot of that goes back to the manure spread, um, along with not fertilizing anymore. That has helped out a lot, too. Um, we noticed that the cows do absolutely wonderful. Like I said before, they're not chasing a tractor around. They're not getting all worked up every time we come out to feed them. They're very relaxed. Um, there's not a lot of pressure on them. They can go eat when they feel like it and then go back to the trees and get some protection. So, yeah, the, the benefits are, are many for window grazing for us. You mentioned that you were, you're able to put up and feed that hay for $50 a ton. Uh, do, you, do you remember 
any of what the numbers were? I mean, I know this is 25 years ago as far as even inflation concerns, but any of the numbers on what they were putting up hay for when they stopped uh, actually rolling it up or, or bailing it? Well, I can't, uh, you know, give you the 25 years ago, but because we still put up a lot of our hay in loose stacks right now, um, I can give you those figures. And, um, you know, like I said, it's $50 a ton for windrowed with no fertilizer. And if we stack that hay in loose stacks, which is how we are putting it up at this point, that's almost $80 a ton. And then you have... Just because... And then we have the cost of feeding that on top of it. Sure. Yep. So, you know, I take that back. That that does include $5 a ton for feeding it. But, um, yeah, so it's a $30 savings per ton. Yep. So you said, uh, was it an hour every three days you spend feeding when it comes to windrow grazing? Is that what, what you said? Yeah. So for 300 cows, we divide the, the cow herd into two different bunches um, for the winter. One bunch is um, cow and heifer calf pairs. And then the other bunch is cows that their steer calves have been weaned off of. Um, and so we actually split that labor also between Shannon's parents and Shannon and I. We each take a bunch. And so you can figure one hour every three days per bunch or two hours every three days. Sure. But that, yeah, for 600. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um. Yes. So how are you controlling their access to the, to the windrows? So we, uh, we start that process with um, planning our grazing every fall. Um, we have an idea of how much production that we'll have in every meadow based on past years. And we just use animal days for the windrow grazing because it's really hard to go out and figure exactly how many tons you do have. Um, but we have records going back to the 80s as far as that goes. So we have a pretty good handle on how much hay we're going to have available. And then we use Google Earth a lot to plot out our our pastures. So we have all of our pastures um, subdivided into probably about quarter section pastures. And then we use poly wire to then subdivide those again so that each each um, paddock that they're in runs them from two to five days. We limit that um, to two to five days so that there's very little waste. If you go longer than five days, then they tend to bed on it and you just don't get the, the consumption that you want. If you go shorter than two days, you might as well be out there with a tractor every day feeding them. Sure. Yep. And they... Go ahead. So we, yeah, we use a lot of poly wire, um, and that's the hour a day that it takes, or hour every few days, um, is just throwing up that poly wire. We have a lot of electric fences out there, so we just jump into those, and um, they're contained for a while for us. Sure. Yeah, and that's a, a very efficient control mechanism. I would imagine that one of the challenges is water availability. Actually, that one is fairly easy for us because we do have a large creek, actually two creeks running through our bottom meadows. And so, um, like I said, we'll get on Google Earth and plot out our pastures so that the first place that they're on is actually on the creek. And then we just remove fences back throughout the pasture. So they always have access to the creek first and then their hay, you know, gradually moves further away from the creek, but they're never more than a quarter of a mile from water. Um, and we're not really worried about trailing that time of year because the ground is frozen. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. So they're grazing away from the water throughout the winter and then gotcha. Um, so I imagine if you're spending one to two hours, depending on how you're figuring it every three days, uh, feeding that that frees up quite a bit of time for uh, some other other work around the ranch. Is that the case? It does. Um, we tend to do some projects, you know, like say building a shed or something like that that might need done. But what's really great for us is, you know, as ranchers and as everybody can um, sympathize with, you're so busy during the bulk of the year from, you know, the beginning of calving until you ship in the fall. 
And so it's really nice for us to have those days freed up a lot throughout the winter, especially here in McFadden, Wyoming, where we typically have some of the strongest wind gusts nationwide (laughs) throughout the winter. (laughs) Um, And so Shannon and I actually have a little side business that we work on um, doing horse hair, you know, belts and head stalls and jewelry on the side because it does free us up so much that we can have time to enjoy our hobby or have time to travel with the kids or go to our kids' basketball games, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, being inside watching the wind blow, braiding a horsehair belt is probably a quite a bit more enjoyable than trying to lead a cow to uh, feed in, in, a, in that same weather. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> uh, what about... Does it? Do you guys take some of that time to uh, work on the business, so to speak, uh, to to analyze some of your unit cost of production and some of that stuff, or is that typically when that work gets done, or is there other times? Actually, that work gets done year round. <laughs> we have found that you know there's not any one good time to do that. You do it when you need to do it. If if a question comes up of, okay, how are we going to market these cows? How are we going to um, you know, supplement feed if we need to, you need to work on it right then. So yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot of time that is spent on the computer in the winter when we're not out feeding, but we, we tend to work on the business anytime that it needs work on, which is quite often. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Well, we are going to take a, a quick break here and thank our sponsors. We're talking about windrow grazing here today with Melinda Sims. Uh, we will be right back. This episode has been brought to you in part by chriswilliamsaudio.com. If you're a musician, podcaster, or filmmaker, don't settle for audio that's less than professional. Head on over to chriswilliamsaudio.com for all your podcasting, music production, and film audio needs. We are back with Melinda Sims here today talking about um, windrow grazing and specifically windrow grazing in the winter months. Um, So what are some of the benefits as far as uh, capturing that that food value in in those windrows. Well, we've actually we spend a lot of time making sure that it is captured. Um, we don't want to get caught having poor feed, so we um, actually take hay samples every fall. We sample about every meadow because it's it's kind of surprising the differences that you'll have from meadow to meadow, and we send our hay samples in and make sure, number one, that our crude protein is going to be met. Um, and we will time our grazing in certain meadows based on the crude, crude protein content. Um, you know, if we have a meadow that, say, isn't up there where we need it to be, say, closer to calving time, then we'll use it early in the, in the winter when her needs are not quite as demanding. Um, what's interesting is we have tested for years and years and found that our stacked hay, which you would think would have a better protein content because it's not as exposed to the elements, um, typically measures about 7.6% crude protein, but our windrow hay always measures 7.5% crude protein, <laughs> not statistically different. Right. <laughs> and a lot of that um, comes from the regrowth that will come up in the windrows. Um, in January, you can go out there and everything's frozen and bitter and awful and move a windrow back and there's actually green grass under there because it's insulated the ground enough that you've gotten green to go with your hay in mm. January, which for here is really a huge benefit. Um, we don't typically see any downfalls as far as nutrient-wise um, with the windrows, the the energy is actually usually higher than our stacked hay. I'm not really sure why that happens. So you haven't, we've had the University of Wyoming out and they've done tests and, and they don't know on that one either, but we, we did figure out the crude protein is because of the regrowth. Sure. Uh, do, do you guys, so how do you sample that hay? I guess is my... So <laughs> it's, we try to be very... Um, non-subjective when we're out there and we just try to reach in a windrow, you know, and get a top layer, a middle layer, and then close to the ground. So you're, you're getting all aspects. And from any one meadow, we'll take six to eight samples and mix it together and then and send it in exactly how you would say a core out of a hay bale. Sure. And that's meadow by meadow you send in those samples. 
We do. Um, sometimes if the meadows are fairly similar or hayed about the same time, we might combine them in. Um, but we, we send in a lot of samples. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, Definitely worth the money. Right. But you guys are, you guys are grazing pretty much year round. Am I, am I right? Well, um, we don't consider it when they're on the windrows. We don't consider that grazing when they are grazing some, uh, we, our meadows are pretty well blown off so they can get to that feed. But once we put the cows on the windrows, I guess maybe they're spoiled. They pretty much stick to eating the windrows and, and we do consider that a fed hay. Sure. I understand. Um, what about the uh, the cow performance on on the windrows? How how are they doing when it comes to eating? They do great. Um, you know, we we do have to watch. We typically go on to uh, windrows somewhere around the fifteenth to uh, of November to the fifteenth of December. Um, for example, this year our pears are going on the twentieth of November, and our dry cows are scheduled to go on the third of December. Um, before that time, they are grazing and that's actually more critical watching their body condition and whatnot before they actually do go onto the windrows to make sure that they're not dropping in their body condition score too much. Um, we can actually pick up body condition score on the windrows because it's good quality feed. It's, it's at least meeting, if not exceeding all of their requirements at all times. If it's not meeting then we do supplement um, a little bit of alfalfa hay every three days if they need it. But we that's one of the reasons that we really test our hay a lot also so we're not wasting money on supplements. Sure. And is that supplement hay that you bring in from outside? It is, yes. Gotcha. And that's exactly where Shannon is right now is unloading that hay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really appreciate you being uh, with me here today at uh, very valuable information. And I, I don't think we've hit any of the challenges yet. So we, we're pre- painting a fairly rosy picture about this, but I, I do want to be real about some of the challenges that you guys have faced. And, and so what are some of those challenges? Absolutely. Well, first of all, I want to dispel one of the myths with windrow grazing, especially in windy Wyoming. Your windrows will not blow away. <laughs> we have never, ever had windrows blow away. And actually, I do take that back. The University of Wyoming did have some windrows that they experimented with, um, and they had a huge gust come in, and it did roll up their hay and wad it up into the fence. But it was, from my understanding, right after it was hayed, they had not gotten any moisture on it yet and no regrowth to tie it down. So if you have that moisture coming down to seal the top of it and kind of put a cap on it and the regrowth coming up from under the bottom to kind of weave its way in and hold it down, you will not have any problems with wind. Um, We do have a lot of trees down here that kind of help break it up, but believe me, McFadden is unbelievably windy. (laughs) (laughs) That's, that's, Um, sorry, that's a paradigm shift there. Um, You know, most people are saying I would love to put up my hay without it ever getting rained on, you know, and you guys are kind of sounds from the sounds of it, crossing your fingers a little bit to get a cap put on it with some rain to uh, to hold it together and hold it down to the ground. Absolutely. As soon as it's windrowed, we love to see a little bit of moisture on it because yeah. it just it just puts that seal on it and it holds in all of the nutrients and holds it down. Um, one of the challenges that we have had, um, especially recently, and this is this is kind of odd for us because we've been doing this for 25 to 30 years, is elk. And we, we typically have elk on our ranch year in, year out. We might have just a small herd of, you know, 20 or less bulls that's around. And they might get into a couple windrows or mess up a fence or two, but it's been nothing detrimental until last year. <laughs> and last year, we ran 186 head of elk throughout the whole winter on our windrows. <laughs> and we could not get rid of them. Wow. And so that was a real challenge for us. And I have to say our game and fish department was amazing in working with us. They really tried to help us run them off, you know, giving us tips for trying to get rid of them. They really have worked with us on a hunting season. Um, We have our hunting season open from October until the end of January, um, just to try to keep some pressure on the elk. Um, 
and they also were really good last year. It was the first time that we've ever asked for compensation, but they were just right up front in giving us compensation for all the windrows that the, the elk did destroy. Because an elk won't just go in and eat a windrow. If that were the case, it wouldn't be a huge deal. But they go in there and pick out all of your really nutritious little leaves, all your clovers, and leave you straw, and then they defecate in it. And cows hate that. (laughs) And so not only are they removing a lot of your nutrients, but they're really just ruining a lot of it, too, to where it's not usable. Um, So the elk were were quite an issue for us. Um, And like I said, we did receive a little bit of compensation from the game and fish for what the elk did ruin. Um, but we had to really make some management changes too. We changed our entire grazing plan and hurried up and got cattle to the area where the elk were to use up those windrows much sooner than we had ever planned on. In fact, probably a month or two sooner than we'd ever planned on. And we also combined herds so that we could use them up faster. Um, there's a certain that was a new uh, ranch lease that we had, and we did not realize how much the elk did hang in on some of those meadows. Um, so this year, what we tried when we hayed is the the meadows that the elk hit, hit really hard. We went ahead and stacked those and windrowed other meadows that the elk, you know, aren't more aren't prone to hang in so much. So we we swapped up what meadows we were windrowing. Um, and, and stack the, the, the problem ones for the elk so that maybe they're not in there so much. We do have some white-tailed deer get in on the, the windrows, but they really don't cause a lot of problems other, other than our temporary electric fence. We have to watch those kind of close with the, with the deer because um, they will kind of tear it up and give the cows a little bit more feed than we're wanting them to have, but that's not a big issue. Sure. Yeah, that was actually... One of my next questions was if, if the fence damage was ever a concern as far as letting cows on to windrows that you weren't ready to let them on yet. But it sounds like it's minimal if if a concern at all, right? Yeah. I mean, if the cows ended up getting onto more windrows than what we had anticipated, a lot of times we can get them back. Um, and if it's such a huge hassle that we can't get them back or they were within a day of moving, we stay really flexible. Um, those cows, especially if they're trailing back across the hay that they left, um, to go get water, if you leave them an extra day, then they're going to go ahead and clean it up. Plus any windrows that are left on the ground, we don't consider that waste because all of those nutrients from the feed breaking down are going into the ground. And whereas we're not buying fertilizer, that's also a pretty important component for us too. Sure. Yeah. And it kind of goes along with the some of the different grazing practices that um, if you leave them in there after they think they've eaten all the good stuff, they'll go back and find some more stuff that maybe they passed over the first time. Is that a pretty good understanding of how they're treating that, that resource? Yeah, it is. And, and we watch them close too. If we don't feel like their body condition can take it, um, then we might move them on or, or come back to it in a couple of weeks because after that amount of time, they think they're going onto something new again anyway. Um, so we, we just try to be really adaptable. If, if something happens and we're not able to graze something the way that we want it to, or they break out and are grazing something else, we just adapt to it. Sure. We'll come back to it or, or let it, let it go and let it be. And it's more nutrients into the ground too. Yep. And that was uh, something I wrote down uh, as I was listening to you is that, you know, we're not talking about a silver bullet here. We're talking about something that is going to still require adaptability or adaptation, you're still going to have to figure out how to manage some of these risks and challenges. And, uh, and every year is probably going to present its own set of risks and challenges. Absolutely. I mean, we, I remember two years ago, um, like I've mentioned, we have the horrible winds here and along our creek, we will get these massive, massive snow drifts. And the meadow that we were grazing actually had ground on both sides of the creek and the cows actually got drifted on to the side of the creek that they had already grazed. And we had a horrible time getting them to hay because we couldn't hardly get them across the drifts, you know, and that's not a challenge that we have every year. That's something you have to adapt to like that instant and go, okay, we've got to do something. 
um, it's not the same year in, year out at all. You're in different meadows at different times of the year um, and you were the last year. So you have different challenges of fencing, you know, over drifts or something that maybe you didn't have to deal with the year before. Sure. And uh, what about snow cover and, and those things? Do they do a pretty good job of getting down in there and finding the the food resource? They absolutely do. And that is one benefit of our wind is it does keep our meadows somewhat blown off. Um, we don't typically have, you know, just a covering of snow at any certain time. Um, and so that makes it pretty easy for them to find the windrows. And then if we do have, you know, 18 inches of snow on, if we put cows into a new meadow, they start nosing around right away. They know that there's going to be windrows there. If they're not finding them, all we have to do is walk to a windrow, lift a little bit of hay out, and they go, oh, there it is. And they will just plow it out within a matter of an hour or so. Gotcha. Well, I, again, I appreciate so much you uh, joining us here today. Uh, Melinda Sims, uh, thank you so much for your time. Are there any uh, resources that you would like to make people aware of, things that you guys have used to learn or uh, uh, things that you have um, that have helped you in this journey? Um, absolutely. There's always, uh, information from the universities. Like I have said, the University of Wyoming has done some studies on windrow grazing. Um, the videos, uh, coming out of Al Alberta on the swath grazing were excellent. We watched those and we learned a lot from those on different methods of fencing, um, and, and just opening your mind to different paradigm shifts. Um, and, also, people are welcome to call us anytime. We've, we've had a lot of experience with windrows, and we would love to be able to get somebody else started down this road if it works for them. Sure. Any, any, where can people go to, to keep up with you or to get in touch with you if they wanted to, to find out some more? Sure. So uh, we have a Facebook page that's Sims Cattle Company. And then I have a website that's simscattlecompany.com. And we can be reached through both of those. And I try to keep kind of like a, a you know, work day-to-day work -day type thing going and pictures coming so people understand what we're going through. And a lot of times I do put a lot of pictures of windrows because that's what we're doing for many months on end here. So there's a lot of pictures of windrows and, and how it works for us on there. Very good. Well, I uh, appreciate your time so much. Thank you for joining us. Um, and that's what we're here to do is to give producers a platform to share paradigm challenging practices. And I think that's what we've done here today. And I appreciate you coming on and being a part of it. Absolutely. Thank you very much. This episode has been brought to you in part by Kamak Ranch Supply. Check out their website at kamakranchsupply.com. If any of the uh, resources that Melinda listed today in our episode piqued your interest, don't hesitate to head on over to workingcows.net slash three, workingcows.net slash three. There will be a detailed show notes page there for you to check out all the things that we talked about, some of the different articles, resources, YouTube videos, and uh, Facebook pages that Melinda talked about uh, will be listed there at workingcows.net slash three. We'll see you next week. We invite you to visit workingcows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, tune in next week.